two little ones are siblings. Oh, okay. Okay. And then this is a cousin. Yeah. 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 One of them lives in yeah. Old yeah. and one of them lives in Old Wellsburg. And Grandpa lives in That was beautiful. Amen. The grace and the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Good morning and welcome home to Unity Presbyterian Church. We, expend, we extend a special welcome to our guests and visitors and invite everyone, visitors and members, to sign the red friendship pads you'll find at the end of your pews. Pam and Josie have those Girl Scout cookies here this morning that you've ordered. Be sure to stop and pick, pick up your order after worship. We have two notes about the cookies this morning. We'll be making sandwiches next Sunday morning in the Unity Kitchen for our friends of the homeless. We need cookies for this mission in the original packaging. Also, that following Tuesday, March 5th, 
is the day is the day mission takes a complete meal down to the faith mission and there is always a need for the cookies for that as well so on your next visit to unity bring along a couple of packages of cookies okay <laughs> and just a quick reminder that today is coffee hour sunday so stay a while after worship to enjoy a treat and some conversation with our unity friends and acquaintances are there any other announcements that we need to make at this time? I have uh, just a couple quick ones. Uh, also, so a couple things going on right after worship. Uh, there will also be confirmation class, I believe, right after worship. And I'll be holding a new members class uh, this morning after worship. Uh, the confirmation will be in the adult ed room. So the new members class, that'll meet with me. Uh, let's, we'll gather at a table in fellowship hall. Uh, so if you have been attending here and wish to become a full member, we would love to welcome you. Uh, it's painless, I promise. Uh, I will teach you what it means to be Presbyterian, how to spell Presbyterian. If there are any Presbyterians already here who you know, are interested in learning uh, what it means to be Presbyterian, you know, maybe now, uh, we'd love to welcome you into the class anyways as well. Uh, we'll have a session today, and there will be a session next week for those who aren't able to make it. Try to get it done all at one time, but we'll kind of play it by ear a little bit. Uh, it'll be a good time. I love doing this sort of thing, so please consider joining me in Fellowship Hall right after worship. Uh, oh, goodness, there was also something else that I'm blanking on now, so I'll sit down and let, uh, let somebody else jump up. We are about a month away from our annual Easter egg hunt. Well, we can't tell it from the snow on the ground this morning. Um, so we are gearing up for that. We are going to be looking for a ton of volunteers to help us out. It is a fun time. It is a great time. It's a, our opportunity to welcome people into the church and to be a part of activities here that don't normally come here um, and to make sure that we're being inclusive for all kids to be able to participate. Um, we, um, first thing I'm going to need is, is somebody to fill eggs, um, more than one person, probably there's a lot of eggs. Um, we're doing the same thing we did last year. We just put tickets inside the eggs. And so we're not going to have to worry about cramming pieces of candy into eggs that don't really fit into the eggs and taping them shut and all the things we've done in the past. The tickets worked really well. So if you're interested in doing that, there'll be a sign up outside in the narthex, um, for you to be able to sign up to take eggs next Sunday, bring them back by the 17th with tickets in there. We do bags of 50. Also, there is QR codes to sign up. There'll be a regular sign up sheet out there and the participant sign up QR code and link is also out in the narthex. So hopefully you can join us and be a part of it. It is, it is a really good time. It's a fun time and it's our opportunity to welcome people from the community. Good morning. Um, I am here to remind everyone that next Sunday, following our service, the Matthew 25 Committee is hosting a lunch to kick off a book study. Uh, we will be reading a book called Quilt of Souls. This is a memoir by Phyllis Biffle Elmore. It's a terrific book, and you'll be glad you read it. We think it will also generate lots of good discussion and sharing. Next Sunday at the lunch, we'll introduce the book, learn a little bit about the author, and provide information on how people can get a copy of the book. Later on in April, we'll have a second meeting to actually discuss the book. So you don't have to read the book by next Sunday. But it, the book introduces us to the author's grandmother, Mama Lula, who was a quilter, among other things. So as part of our kickoff luncheon, we'd like to have a quilt show. We're encouraging any quilters among our congregation to come and bring a sample of your quilts uh, and quilting stories next Sunday to share. We're also asking that even if you're not a quilter, but you have a quilt that you love or one that means something to you, um, bring that to share as well. We'll have some tables set up for people to uh, share their quilts. It'll be informal, but we think it'll be a great time. Um, even if you aren't sure yet whether or not you want to join us for reading Quilt of Souls, uh, please come next Sunday, enjoy some homemade soup, enjoy some quilts and their stories. Um, I think you'll have a good time. Thank you.
Are there any other announcements anyone would like to make? David? Good morning, everyone. Okay, so I have this nice calendar for $10. It's for my cause, CP Cal CP Awareness, and it's $10. And my goal is $1,000. Yeah, bye. <laughs> Yes, and let me say, I bought one of those calendars, and they really, really are cool. Mm -hmm. Any more announcements? that the car is going off out there, Brian? It's an Impala. It's an Impala. All right, this, this side on the church, along the education wing, third down, an Impala is going off. So, <laughs> Is that you, Chris? It's the, uh, the alarm is going off. <laughs> All right, I think you're good. All right, is that all? Would you please jo join me for a call to worship? Please rise. As please. You're able. Thank you. Lent calls us to journey this and every day following Jesus wherever he leads us. Lent calls us to the place where God covenants with us, to receive the names we are given. Lent calls us to worship together, to tell future generations the good news. Lent calls us to practice justice, to bring hope to all God's people. Lent calls us to faithful living, to trust the one who gives us life, And our hymn today will be number 726.
Would you all please join me in the prayer of confession? Jesus calls us to deny ourselves, yet we trust in our own works rather than in God's grace. Jesus calls each of us to take up our cross, yet rather know selfishness and sin to be put to death. We cling to what we know. Jesus calls us to follow him, yet we fear where faith will lead and what it might change in our lives. Forgive us, Lord, and grant us faith. Help us trust in your presence and faithfulness as we journey into the unknown following your call. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Beloved children of God, let us be reconciled with our neighbors in a spirit of humility and repentance as we share with one another the peace of Christ. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Let us exchange signs of peace and reconciliation with our neighbors. Mama duck and baby ducks. Are the baby ducks normally like running all around crazy or are they right there with a the mama duck? Right? So they typically will stay right there. Why do you think that is? To stay safe, right? The mama duck is the one that protects them and keeps them safe from all of the things that could happen to them, right? I am holding a picture of what? A mama duck and baby duck swimming in the pond. Clara? Okay, there are six baby ducks and one mama duck in the in the picture. So when we say when Jesus says we should follow him, why do you think that is? Jerry? to keep us safe, to do, to do, we're doing things that we should be doing, right? Any other ideas? Hi. What, Emma? Um, 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 um,
So just like these baby ducks in this picture, we should follow Jesus, right? To, to be able to stay safe and to do the things that he wants us to do. He sets a good example for us, just like the mama duck sets for the baby ducks. All right, let's go ahead and we'll do an echo prayer. Dear God, help us to follow you. In your name we pray. Amen. Wow, that was pretty good. <laughs> That's a good way to start. Okay, proclaiming, proclaiming the word, this is the prayer for illumination. God of wonders, we come to your word again and again, seeking understanding and the new life it offers. By the power of your Holy Spirit, illumine, illumine our hearts and minds so that we may, we may believe this testimony and have eternal life. In the name of Jesus Christ, our teacher and savior, we, we pray. Amen. And now the Old Testament reading. This is from Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 7. 
and chapters 15 through 16. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her and also give you a son by her. I will bless her and she will give rise to nations. The kings of peoples shall come for her, from her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Beloved children of God, we will affirm our faith this morning uh, using a portion of the Confession of 1967. So please rise as you're able and let us profess the faith that we share. The reconciling work of Jesus was the supreme crisis in the life of humankind. His cross and resurrection become personal crisis and present hope for women and men when the gospel is proclaimed and believed. In this experience, the Spirit brings God's forgiveness to all, moves people to respond in faith, repentance, and obedience, and initiates the new life in Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Our gospel reading this morning is from the Good News According to Mark. The eighth chapter, uh, the lectionary gave us verses 31 through 38. Um, I've added a little bit of preamble uh, with the confession at Caesarea Philippi, so uh, I will be reading verses 27 through 38. Let us listen together for a word from God. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any wish to come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
What we just heard is in every imaginable way the central passage in Mark's account of the gospel. These verses mark the beginning of a major transition in Mark's story of Jesus' life and ministry. Here the gospel shifts from being about Jesus' healing miracles and teachings as he travels through the Judean countryside and shifts to a focused narrative of his journey to Jerusalem that puts him on an unavoidable collision course with the cross. Here today we heard the first of three passion predictions when Jesus tells his disciples that he must undergo, must undergo suffering, rejection, and death. And he instructs anyone who would follow him to do the same, bearing a cross in the same way that he himself will. And all of this starts with a seemingly simple and benign question. Who do people say that I am? What are people saying about me? And the answers that he got from his disciples were pretty much what Jesus expected. People saw his ministry as being in line with that of the ancient prophets who announced God's intention for human life and challenged the people to bring their lives individually and together into line with that vision. Well, some people say you are John the Baptist reincarnated. Others say you're Elijah brought back from the heavens. And still others say you're one of God's prophets. And so he takes the dialogue one step further, pushes a little harder. Who do you say that I am? These disciples knew him better than anyone. They had not just seen the miracles he had performed, they had participated in them, heard the teachings behind them, and knew the power and authority by which Jesus did these things. They knew he was more than just another healer, miracle worker, or prophet. And so Peter speaks up. You are the Messiah. The Christ, the one God has anointed to restore Israel. Uh, linguistic parenthetical note here. Messiah and Christ are the same word. Right? The, the Hebrew, Mashiach, means anointed one. The Greek, Christos, means anointed one. So Messiah, Christ, both mean anointed one. And so the Messiah, the Christ, was the one anointed by God, blessed with the power to restore the kingdom of Israel. So Peter answers rightly, you are the Messiah. Now here's where things start to get a little weird. First, Jesus instructs the disciples to not let anyone know that this is who he is. And then he turns all of their expectations about a Messiah upside down, saying that it is necessary. It is part of God's plan for him and for the world, for him to suffer, to be rejected by the religious institutions and leaders, to be killed, and then to rise from the dead. Wait, 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 wait. Peter objects. Peter, who had just professed Jesus as the Messiah. That's not how this works. The Messiah doesn't suffer and die at the hands of the empire. He fights back and throws the Romans out of God's land and frees us from the empire. Peter just can't believe what he's hearing Jesus say. For centuries, the Jews, including the disciples, were looking for a powerful leader, a military king like David, 
to restore Israel to freedom and power and faithfulness. And here, Jesus is shaping up to be a huge disappointment. Peter's human expectations and hopes about what a Messiah should be and do stand at dramatic odds with the way God came to actually be in the world. Peter, you are setting your mind on human things. But it's in this scandal, this disappointment, that the good news of the gospel is found. Because instead of a mighty king who comes in power, we have a shepherd God who comes to meet us in our weakness and vulnerability. Instead of a remote distant God off somewhere in the stars, in the heavens. We confess a Messiah who gets down in the dirt with us. A God who entered fully into human life and who knows intimately the pain, fear, loss, disappointment, loneliness of human life. And so just as God joined fully in the life of humanity, Jesus now turns to the crowd following him and invites them and us to join him fully on his road. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves. And I always like to artificially separate themselves instead of one word, instead of the compound word, let them deny their selves, themselves. Let us deny our selves, our small, ego-driven, acquisitive, myopic selves. All right, but if anyone wants to be my follower, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Put down yourselves and take up the cross and follow Jesus. What started as an innocent question ends up here as a radical invitation to discipleship and a challenging description of the life of faith. The relationship between Christ's identity and our own is inescapable. Who we believe and profess Christ is has everything to do with who we understand ourselves to be and how we are called to be in the world. As followers of a suffering Messiah, of a God who joins us, in the muck and the mess, the blood, sweat, and tears of human life, we're called, first of all, to deny ourselves, to humble ourselves and remember that it's not about us. The life of faith and discipleship has absolutely zero to do with getting our way having our expectations or opinions confirmed, or inflating our own egos and sense of self-worth. Rather, the life of faith has everything to do with joining in God's work of healing this hurting world. As we'll hear in next week's reading, this is about seeking not to be great, but to live lives in service to everyone. It's about putting aside our agendas, biases, and opinions, and being fully open to God working in and through us. And to do this, to follow Jesus and take up the cross and join in his work and ministry, means to walk the road that he walked, 
to go where he went, to the places of greatest need, to go to the people he went to, to touch the untouchable, to love the unlovable, to embrace the outcast, to break bread with sinners and hypocrites. To take up the cross and follow Jesus means to go where he went, to stand where he stood, on the side of people who were vulnerable and outcast and marginalized, on the side of people who were broken and hurting, who weren't good enough to be accepted by the religious in crowd and to stand against the smug, self-assured religiosity of the scribes and Pharisees who thought that they and they alone were deserving of God's blessings and used scripture to keep those people out. To bear the cross is to take the risk of showing a radical love and welcome, to stretch out an embrace that goes far beyond the boundaries of what our human hearts and minds can even imagine. To bear the cross isn't to suffer through unpredictable tragedies or put up with some sort of minor inconvenience, which is how most of us use it, right? Well, that's just my cross to bear. No, to take up the cross the way Jesus did is to knowingly and intentionally stand at odds with the dehumanizing forces of empire, of sin and death, and to shout no to all the powers of death that seek to quench the spirit of God that inhabits every human life. To take up the cross and follow our suffering, dying, rising Messiah is to walk the road that he walked, remembering that it led to Golgotha, the place of death but remembering also that the road doesn't end there and that it leads through the empty tomb to the glory and promise of new life. Because of this suffering and dying and rising Messiah, death will never have the last word. In Christ, God has inhabited the darkest, most frightful, most painful corners of human life, and has reconciled all of life to God's own self. And so it is that we can say with confidence that nothing, nothing, nothing in life or in death can ever separate us from the love of God. In this knowledge, we are freed and we're invited to take up the cross and follow where our Messiah has gone. This invitation goes beyond mere doctrinal statements and professions of faith. The invitation to discipleship isn't about saying or believing the right things about Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah. Jesus' invitation was and is and always will be about being transformed, about dying to our small, ego-driven selves so that he might dwell fully in us. Lord, let me decrease that you might increase. And this invitation calls for an active, committed response. Will we take up the cross and follow? I pray that in the depths of our being, 
we will, with the help of God, to whom be all glory and honor now and forever. Amen. And children of God, I invite you to rise. Let us lift our bodies and spirits to the Lord as we're each able, as we sing together hymn number 39, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Y'all may be seated. <laughs> I love hearing and learning new hymns, and I'll remind everyone that every hymn was new at a certain point. There was a time when people didn't know Amazing Grace or Great is Thy Faithfulness, and people probably grumbled, that's unsingable, we can't do that, and here we are. Uh, so I, I love learning new hymns. Uh, but I also love looking out and seeing everyone singing and faces out of the hymnals because we know this so well. And seeing and hearing y'all just singing with, such, uh, with just such joy and love, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, so children of God, we have the privilege and the responsibility to pray with and for one another with and for this world that God loves so much. And so I invite you to share any joys or concerns you're carrying on your hearts this morning, any needs or requests, thanksgiving or gratitude that you wish to express. When we hear a joy, a cause for celebration and thanksgiving, I'll say, Lord, for these blessings. And together, let us say, 
we give you thanks. And when we hear a cause for concern or a place that needs God's healing touch, I'll say, Lord, in your mercy, and together let us say, hear our prayer. So, children of God, for what and whom do you pray this day? Chris. Amen. We pray. Uh, we pray for the staff person where Chris is staying, and uh, indeed for all of us, uh, we pray for wisdom, for guidance, uh, for discernment and assurance from God as we walk the paths that are set before us. So, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Any others? Well, Get Gail, and then I'll bounce back to Martha. Amen. Yes. I mean, we don't have to accept it, but God's will is going to be done whether we like it or not. Right? Yes, it sure is. <laughs> Amen. Yes, we, we join Gail in giving thanks and praise to God uh, that her sister Velta is home and is doing well after uh, a scare and a trip to a couple hospitals. And we, and we give thanks that God knows what God is doing, even when we may not. And we pray for the wisdom, the courage, and the discernment to maybe catch and perceive small glimpses of what God is doing. So, Lord, for these blessings, we give you thanks. Martha. Yes. Amen. We join, join with, I assume, both the Gilbrides in... The, in giving thanks for the gift of grandchildren and for a new grandbaby in the family. Yes, my, my parents always remind me that grandparents are your reward for not killing your own children. Uh, so, so, you know, even though I can't speak to that personally, we, we give thanks uh, for the gift of family, of children and grandchildren, and for the blessing of new life. Lord, for these blessings, we give you thanks. I saw another hand going up. Tim and Andy, and I saw Carol in there as well. Yes, Tim, go ahead. Amen. Yes, we give thanks to God for uh, Tim's mother-in-law, 96 years old, who went into the hospital um, with concerns about her pacemaker, ended up having gallbladder removed, and uh, is home and is doing well for all of God's healing miracles, for medical professionals and the gifts and discoveries of medicine and science and all of the ways that folks work God's healing in our lives. Lord, for these blessings, we give you thanks. And then Andrea. Amen. Thank 
you. Yes, we join uh, with Nikki and Anna Mayhood, who uh, have both been, uh, both been sick in varying capacities for pretty long stretches of time. Uh, we pray for their healing and wholeness, and they're both waiting for test results to come back, so we pray for peace and courage in the time of waiting and for good results from those tests. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. And Laura, Laura Shellman, who uh, is undergoing or has undergone, has undergone foot surgery, we pray for a swift and full recovery, Lord, and for the restoration of easy movement and freedom of movement, Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Hear our prayer. And Carolyn. but uh, the cards can go home. Amen. So we give thanks to God uh, for a successful surgery for Brandon Vodeberg. He is home after just a couple of days, uh, and we celebrate and give thanks for that, and we echo the family's gratitude uh, for a community of faith that is supportive and prayerful, and you can keep the cards going to the house, uh, because they're keeping a scrapbook of everything he's gotten. We pray for a full recovery from this surgery, and we pray that uh, it has the desired and successful outcome and eases some of the medical concerns that Brandon has. Lord, for these blessings, Amen. we give you thanks, and Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. Are there any others, beloved children of God? Joanne. Um, I had a, have a dear friend at the beginning of the year. She had some serious health issues. She had to go on dialysis. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't realize what a task that is mm -hmm. if somebody has to go through that. But she had um, excellent or good news that Monday will be her last um, session. Yes, amen. Yes. Yeah, we, we, jo we join with Joanne in praising and giving thanks to God that uh, her friend will be coming off of dialysis on Monday, and we just give thanks for all of the miracles that we experience every day and pray that our eyes may be opened to them and we might live in gratitude and joy. Lord, for these blessings, amen. we give you thanks. Now, lifting to God all of these joys and concerns that have been named, as well as those we name in our hearts, let us join our hearts and voices together, praying with confidence as children of God the prayer our Lord taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
Friends, what will it profit us to gain the whole world but forfeit our soul? With all humility, we're invited to make our offering to God, trusting not in the scarcity of worldly gain, but in the abundance of God's sustaining grace. In gratitude for gifts we have been given to share, let us rise, let us lift our bodies and spirits to the Lord. As we sing together the Lenten doxology you'll find printed in your bulletins. O oh God, receive our gifts as a sign that our lives are committed to your work in this world. May these gifts enable flourishing for all your children and the whole creation. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And please remain standing as you're able as we sing together hymn number 339, Lift Every Voice and Sing. Beloved children of God, knowingly, willingly, take up your crosses. Shout no to all the powers of sin and death that restrict human life and flourishing. 
and follow Christ where and as he leads, in love, in humility, in hope, and in healing, to the places of greatest hurts and exclusion. What does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? To seek justice and love kindness and walk humbly with your God. Go now in peace. And may the grace and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love and the power of God who created us all, and the communion and community of the Holy Spirit abide with and sustain you each and all this day and evermore. Amen. about wasting that battery. I should have thought about it. 